Well, hello there again. This is Grandpa Phil. I decided I'd read some more chapters from this fi fine book here called Hank the Cow Dog and Monkey Business. Now, you remember the last time we had a, a session why I was reading a chapter about how Hank let the monkey out of the box and then took charge of him, and the monkey seems to be doing all that Hank wants him to do. Well, of course, being the head of security, he's glad he's finally found somebody he can rely on to do things the way he wants them done. So this is chapter seven, and it's called Monkey See, Monkey Do. If you recall, we had assigned Drover, his buddy, a routine patrol job in the eastern quadrant of ranch headquarters. Well, we found him asleep in his gunny sack in our gas tank throne room. Now, he's saying we and our because he's thinking that he's real important now, and he refers to himself in what we call the third person. We extended our paw toward the offender. Monkey sees him. Monkey chatted with sheer delight, jumped into the middle of the sleeping gold bricker, and pinned him to his bed. Drover received a rude awakening, and when he saw what was sitting a straddle of him, why, his eyes became large white plates with little black dots in the center. Hank, oh my gosh, Mayday, Mayday, help, murder. Well, we floated into the throne room, and seated ourselves upon the royal gunny sack throne. He's hollering, Hank, who is this guy? Get him off of me. I said, silence, you disur disturb our tranquility. Now, uh, what's going on? Who, oh my gosh, Hank, I've got a monkey on me. We smiled and fingered the large emerald ring upon our paw course he's just imagining all this drover you have disobeyed us and as a result you have been seized by our captain of the guard who hank where'd you get oh i bet you opened the box didn't you and there was a monkey inside oh good there for a minute i thought i was having a bad dream can you get him off of me we could drover but we won't we, who's we? We, we, the great grand potentate of the ranch. Drover gave me a silly grin. What are you talking about? You must be, I hope you're, I, I think I missed something. Yes, indeed. While you slept, Drover, many things happened. We have been crowned great, great, potentate of the ranch, and our monkey has been named captain of the guard and second in command. Se second in, wh what about me? You are now third in command, or last in command, as it were. You mean, exactly. In the future, you will take orders from Captain Monkey. You will also accept his punishment for sleeping on the job. But Hank, this leg of mine, monkey, pull his whiskers and tweak his nose. Ee, ee, monkey did as he was told. I could see that he really enjoyed his work. Oh, ouch, quit that. Hank, get him off of me. He's pulling my whiskers. Exactly. And now you will thank him for improving you. Thank him for, Hank, are you feeling all right? He just pulled my whiskers and... We leaped up from our throne. You will thank Captain Monkey for improving you, or we will order him to improve you some more. Well, you'd better do that, because I'm not going to thank any monkey for wh pulling my whiskers. Our lip curled, and we glared down at the little mutt. You insolent wench. I'm sorry, that's insolent wretch. Very well. As you have spoken it, and so shall it be. We floated over to Captain Monkey and whispered something in his ear. He's up to no good, isn't he? What I whispered in his ear was, 
Top Secret Procedure For subduing and gaining control of a dog, any dog, regardless of how big or mean or stubborn he might be. I had never revealed this secret to anyone, not even to Drover, and for very good reason. Such a secret, once revealed, can become a double-edged blade in the razor of life. Not only can it shave closer and faster, but it can... Well, you can imagine. He means somebody might use it on him. Let's back up and start over. Such a secret, once revealed, can be used by small minds against the revealer. If the revealer happens to be a dog, don't you see? I wouldn't have taught the trick to just anyone, but by this time I had established that the monkey was my loyal and obedient subject. Also, not shrewd enough to use it against me. Do I dare reveal the secret here? No, better not risk it. Or I'll tell you what, we'll make a deal. I'll reveal the secret if you'll raise your right hand and swear never to tell anyone else or use it against a dog. Okay, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, your name, do solemnly swear never to repeat this top secret procedure to anyone or to use it against an innocent dog. Now we're set. Are you ready to hear the secret? Well, here it is. If you want to shut down and humble a dog, grab his tongue and hold on. As long as you have that tongue, he can't talk back, bite, or bark, or do anything. Well, there it is. That's the secret I whispered in my monkey's ear. Now, don't forget that you've sworn an oath and never repeat it. I'm talking to every one of you now. Now, back to the story. When we had revealed this utmost dark secret to the monkey, he grinned from ear to ear, and once again, we saw that wicked gleam shining in his eyes. We returned to our throne and seated ourselves. Now, Drover, you will thank Captain Monkey for aiding you in your quest for self-improvement. Well, he he replied, Well, I really don't think I want to... Lum, lum, wo, wo, lum, lum. We smiled. Drover, we're afraid we missed the last part of your statement. Could you say it again a little louder this time? Lum, lum, wo, lum, lum, wo, lum, lum. Well, you know what's happened. That monkey got a hold of his tongue. Mercy, it seems Captain Monkey has seized you by the tongue and rendered you helpless. Could this be a message of sorts? Hmm. Lumwug, wug. Well, so it seems. When your little rebellion has passed and you're ready to follow orders, well, then you can give us a sign and we'll issue the command for Captain Monkey to release your tongue. Several minutes passed while Drover lummed and wummed and mummed in protest, but his protest didn't do a lick of good, so to speak. He's making a joke. A lick of good because he's talking about his tongue. <laughs> uh, didn't do a lick of good, so to speak, because my monkey kept a good grip on his tongue. At last, Drover crossed his eyes, which I figured was a sign that he was ready to give up. Well, I guess so if his eyes are crossing. Monkey, release the scoundrel's tongue. That was odd. The monkey shook his head and scowled, almost as though he didn't understand the order or didn't want to understand the order. We pushed ourselves up from the royal gunny sack throne and marched over to him. Your master has spoken. Release the tongue. Chop, chop. Bula, bula, right now. This time he did as he was told, but with a certain air of resentment that I didn't... Ma'am... I salted this clue away for future reference. Unless I was badly mistaken, my loyal monkey showed signs of having thoughts of his own. Hank wasn't counting on that. There are several things you look for in a good monkey, and thoughts of his own ain't one of them. We would deal with the monkey later, but at the moment, our most pressing problem was curbing Grover's little outburst of rebellion. Are you ready now to repent, O oh lowly one? I, I guess, but I, I didn't like 
What you like or dislike is of no concern to us. Thank Captain Monkey. So Drover scowled and pressed his lips together in a pout. Thank you, Captain Monkey, for your help in making me a better dog. Excellent. Let him up, Monkey. We have guided him through the dark night of rebellion and around the sharp rocks of... I said let him up, Monkey. Again, that same grudging look. I didn't like it. Obviously, I needed to do some more work on this monkey, and I made a mental note to attend to, attend to it first thing after my nap. Well, Drover scrambled to his feet and began backing away from us. I said it, Hank, but I don't like it, and I don't like your monkey either, and I'm sorry you let him out of the box, and I think you're going to be sorry too. Drover's smarter than we thought he was. Captain Monkey snarled and made a move toward little Mr. Talkback when he ought to keep his trap shut. And then we had to step between them to keep Captain Monkey from teaching him another painful lesson. You may leave, Drover. Go contemplate your naughty behavior. Next time, we won't let you off so easy. Off with you. Be gone. All right, I'll go, but I still don't like that monkey. I made a move toward him, and he made a lightning dash for the machine shed. I yawned. <laughs> Feeling tired all at once from the strains of government governing all my unruly kingdom, and I returned to my... Wait a minute, the monkey was sitting on my throne and grinning. Well, get off my throne, you flea-bitten circus clown, and don't go near it again. For that, we command you to slap yourself three times and stand in the corner until we have taken our royal nap. Well, that was more like it. He slapped himself three times in the face and placed his nose in the corner of the northeast angle iron leg of the gas tanks. We fluffed up our gunny sack, walked around it in a tight circle, and flopped down. Oh, wonderful gunny sack. Oh, delicious sleep. I stretched out, wiggled around until I found a comfortable spot and had all four paws sticking up in the air. I closed my eyes and I began drifting off. Ah, oh, sweet Beulah of the flaxen hair and soft brown eyes, the collie girl of my dreams, love of my life, giver of all good things, source of inspiration and happiness. I glimpsed her in the distance, in the fog, in the foggy distance. I could see the longing in her eyes. I called her name and she called mine. We ran towards each other, our hearts aflame, but the fog rolled between us. Beulah! Hank! Oh, Beulah! Oh, Hank! Oh, Beulah! Oh! Oh, Hank, oh. And just then, I heard music. A song, in fact. It went like this. It's called, I Can See You Now. It goes like this. I can see you now just the way you were when daylight found you. I can see you now with the morning's golden glory all around you. I can see the wind, soft fingers running through your hair, the amber light reflected in your eyes. I can see the field of flowers like a rainbow splashed across the earth and stretching to the skies. I can see you now just the way you were when evening found you. I can see you now with the purple shadows falling all around you. I can see the wind's cool fingers running through your hair and evening stars reflected in your eyes. I can see bright colors fading all around you as night's blue velvet veil is drawn across the skies. Pretty catchy, huh? 
I can see you now just the way you were when darkness found you. I can see you now, but the memory starts to fade as night surrounds you. I can hear you calling to me in the darkness. I hear the words, but don't know what they mean. I can see stars in your eyes like burning embers. But just before the dawn, I wake and it's a dream. I see you now, I see you now, I see you now. This is all in his dream. He's very creative. Okay, this is chapter 8 coming up next. It's called The Pasha of Shazam. Well, that sounds important. It was, to say the least, a bittersweet dream, which sort of describes the way things have gone with Beulah from the very beginning. Beulah is the dog he was dreaming about, remember? If that bird dog would just go away, oh well, I don't want to get started on Plato. He knows a bird dog named Plato. That's pretty fancy. Except to say that any dog who chases birds can't be very smart. And any woman who chases bird dogs, when she could have a brave, magnificent, great, grand, potentate cow dog for the same price, while she's walking the fine line between poor taste and terrible judgment. But I don't want to get started on that. There's no rational explanation for it. And that's what torques me about the whole thing. I mean... Is there anything dumber or less significant than pointing? Whoops, I missed the page here. Sometimes it slips away from me. Is there anything dumber or less significant than pointing at birds? Who cares about birds? If you're going to point something, point something that matters. That's what I always say. But never mind, I can't be bothered. What is it about that stupid, spotted, stick-tailed bird dog that holds her interest day after day, week after week, and month after month? Why, it's just outrageous. But the important point to remember in all this is that I really don't care. <laughs> so he says. He sure does go on a lot about some of the, something he don't supposedly care about, though, doesn't he? Hmm. There are other women in the world, hundreds of them, Thousands of them. And she wants to go chasing after a stupid, well, fooey. Nevertheless, it was a wonderful dream. In a painful sort of way. And I wouldn't have minded running it over and over through the entire afternoon and into the evening hours. But that wasn't to be. Drover, the little dunce, began pulling on my ears. When I felt the first tug... On my left ear, I growled pretty much on instinct and told him, Driver, you're devilish, you basically vehicle. That wasn't me, Hank. You'd better wake up and see. And you better think I'm faster, bigger, See, Hank's kind of halfway between awake and asleep. Then he hears, Hank, get up, somebody's here. Uh, of course, somebody says this snort wheeze here. Uh, uh, we've been talking to each other. Drover said, no, I mean somebody else. He said, tell him I'm busy. Tell him I died three weeks ago. Tell him. And then he pulled my ear again. Tell him that if you pull my ear again, you nincompoop, I'm going to build a mud hole in the middle of your face. That seems pretty, pretty wild, doesn't it? Then he pulled it again. Well, that did it. My eyelid, my eyelid sprang open, and once my eyeballs quit rolling around and locked in on the target, I saw, huh? This face, see? Two big eyes, short nose, a broad grinning mouth, jug ears, a red jacket, and a red fez on top of its head. Drover didn't wear a red fez or have jug ears or a short nose. Drover, I don't want to alarm you, but something has happened to your face. Then all at once it has begun to resemble a, I heard a voice say, a monkey, Hank? Exactly. All these years you've acted like a monkey and now the chickens have come home. 
Drover, is there something we need to discuss? Yeah, I think your monkey's got some business on his mind. Uh, what, w would that be called monkey business? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, he's sitting on your chest. I told him to get off, but he only made teeth at me and stuck out his tongue. I see. Yes, it's all coming clear now. I gave him strict orders to stand with his nose in the corner. He has disobeyed, and now we have the case of the disobedient monkey. Well, I guess so. What are you going to do? Very simple, Drover. Obviously, the little whelp has forgotten his place in the overall scheme of things and must be taught a lesson. I'll simply order him to get off my chest. Well, that sounds like a good idea, if he'll do it. Oh, he'll do it. I'll speak to him in his own dialect. Watch this and study your lessons. I beamed at steely gaze into the eyes of the monkey. Monkey, get off dog at once. Hurry scurry, bula bula, chop chop. Well, he didn't seem to understand. Instead of following my orders, he flicked the end of my nose with his finger. And then he grinned down at me. That flicking business, it hurt. I tried another try, attack. Monkey, not understand. Monkey, get off. And, well, he flicked my nose again. Monkey, bad monkey to flick master's nose with finger. Monkey, be good monkey. Get off. And, and then he did it again. I don't think he speaks that language, Hank. He keeps flicking your nose. So it seems, Drover, and now I have no choice but to translate my message into the universal language, brute force. Oh, gosh, don't hurt him. I'll try to be gentle, but I can't make any promises. I took a deep breath and concentrated all the muscles in my highly conditioned body into an upward surge. Within a period of only a few seconds, I struck him in the chest with my front paws. I kicked him in the back with my hind paws and I arched my back like a bucking horse. Pretty impressive, huh? But you know, these monkeys are used to living in trees, and it's a little hard to shake one loose. I struggled and thrashed until I could struggle and thrash no more. The fool monkey was still sitting on my chest. And you might say that he had, well, pinned my front legs to the ground, so to speak. And you might say that he had, well, Oops, said Drover, that didn't work too well. Well, it's just a simple language problem, Drover. Nothing to be alarmed about. The little brute thinks I want to play with him. I'll have to use a sterner tone of voice, that's all. So I narrowed my eyes and I made teeth at him and I snarled. Monkey, unpin legs right now. Chop, chop, or face disastrous consequences. He unpinned my legs. I winked at Drover and gave him a smile. There, you see, he can't monkey around with a monkey. You got to be firm. I turned back to the monkey. Now, monkey, get off and wogglum, wogglum. The little snot had reached into my mouth and taken hold of my tongue and pulled it out a full six inches and was... Did I mention that one of the dangers of revealing the top secret? Yes, I did. And just as I had feared... Oh, my gosh, Hank. He's got your tongue. Wugglum, wugglum, wugglum. I can't understand what you're saying. Wugglum, 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 wugglum. Do you want the monkey to turn loose of your tongue? Uh-huh. At that moment, the monkey spoke for the first time. My name is not Minky. I am Pasha of Sazam, Lord Temporal and Spiritual and heir to the throne of Raj Kumari. Drover's eyes widened, and he took two steps backwards. Oh, my gosh. He's talking, Hank. And did you hear what he said? Uh-huh. Well, um, the monkey looked at Drover. Tell your friend. The monkey tells Drover. Tell your friend that he will not get his tongue back until he recognizes that he is a lowly subject of the Pasha of Shazam. You will tell him that. I will. Indeed you will. 
What if I go hide in the machine shed? If you go hide in this machine shed place, I will follow you and pull your tongue. I just thought I'd ask. He came creeping over, and he whispered in my ear, Hank, did you hear? Uh-huh. I guess we better do what he says. Uh-huh. Just then, the monkey released my tongue and said, Are you ready now to be a loyal subject of the Pasha? Funny that you should ask, I said in a bold tone of voice. Number one, you're not a Pasha. You're a monkey. Number two, I'm in charge of the ranch, and woglum woglum won't. He sat there on my chest, grinning down at me and holding on to my tongue. Perhaps you would like to try it again. Uh, he gave my tongue back. I rolled it around in my mouth and licked my chops. As I was saying, we could probably work out some kind of compromise. The monkey, uh, the Pasha, wagged one hairy little finger in, finger in front of my nose. No compromise. I am Pasha. You are lowly, stinking, unwanted subjects. Yes, well, that sounds like the kind of compromise we could go for, so to speak. Now, if you'll get off my... You must obey Pasha, or bad things will come. Of, yes, of course. You promise obey Pasha, or shall Pasha seize your tongue again? Well, no, let's not get... I think we could probably... Promise or no promise? Oh, I, uh, I, I guess that we could take that under... All right, you win, we promise. And with that, he crawled off my chest and let me up. That was his first mistake, letting me up, because I had already devised a clever plan for tabbing... Tar well, he's talking funny again. He says, that was the first mistake, letting me up, because I had already devised a clever plan for tabbing the turtles on this upstart monkey. <laughs> tabbing the turtles. Turning the tables, I should say, for you, for you see, I had begun drawing on my reserves of ancient cow dog wisdom. If at first you don't succeed, bark. If at second you don't succeed, run for the house. And that's just what we did. Well, fellers, we ran for the house. My monkey had gotten out of control and had decided that he was hot stuff, but he had never gone up against my favorite ranch wife, Sally May. And I had a feeling that when Sally May got through with him, he'd have enough broom tracks on him that he'd forget about this being a Pasha of Shazam. One more chapter. This one's called Attacked by a Naked Woman. I can't believe it. That's what it says. Before the monkey could take defensive measures, we went streaking towards the house. When we came to the yard fence, why, I sprouted wings, fellers. I jumped that fence like a deer, landed safely on the other side, and didn't slow down till I was standing on the porch, pressing up against the screen. Drover was just a few steps behind me. We made it, Hank. We pulled it off. Yes, we did, and nice work. I think Sally May will be proud of us for this one, Drover. Now we sound the alarm and alert the house. Bark, Drover, as you've never barked before. Boy, did we bark. We bristled the hair on our backs and lifted our heads and leaned into our barking. Loper had already gone for the day, but I knew Sally May was there. The door opened and little Alfred, age four, came toddling out into, into the utility room. He was ready, wearing red and white polka dot pajamas. His eyes were still puffy with sleep, and he had an easy grin on his face. Drover, I said, if we can coax him to open the screen door, we'll take refuge in the house. But what if Sally May, as long as we stay in the utility room and remain quiet, she'll never know we're there. He said, I'm scared of Sally May. All right, I'll go into the house, and you stay out here and entertain the Pasha of Shazam. Oh, well, I think I'll go inside, he said. I thought maybe you would. Little Alfred came to the screen door and grinned down on us. Hi, doggies, what you all doing? 
In the security business, there are certain techniques we use for begging our way into areas that are off limits. We whine, we wag our tails, whimper, quiver, hop up on our back legs, and scratch on the screen with our paws. If you've never seen a highly trained, well-conditioned cow dog going through the heavy beg maneuver, you'll just have to take my word for it. It's very impressive. Little Alfred's mother, had she come to the door, would have provided a stern test of our ability. She was a hard sell. Her heart must have been whittled out of petrified wood. But little Alfred, he was younger, kinder, and more pliable. And he also happened to be a special pal of mine. When he came to the screen door, I called in all the old IOUs. I mean, this was an emergency situation, and I put our friendship on the line. I put enough heavy bags on him to break his heart four times. And you know what? He opened the screen door and let us into the utility room. Under ordinary conditions, I would have been satisfied to remain out in the utility room, along with the muddy boots, the overshoes, the old smelly gloves, chaps, spurs, and so forth. But this was a serious deal. And while the utility room was probably safer than the outside, it wasn't quite as safe as the house itself with its thick walls and lockable doors. So when I saw that little Alfred had left the door into the house ajar, well, it occurred to me that he probably wanted us to take refuge inside the house. Well, that made perfectly good sense. I mean, here was a kid who realized the value of his dogs and wasn't about to take any chances with them. Smart kid. These kids will surprise you how sharp they are. So I scrambled through the door and I entered the house. Right away, I faced a decision. Which way to go? I was standing in the hall, don't you see? with the kitchen to my right and the bathroom to my left. Well, it was common knowledge that at this hour of the day, Sally Mae would have finished cleaning up the breakfast dishes and moved into the living room, where no doubt she would be playing with baby Molly on the floor or reading a magazine. Well, now that we were safe inside the house, warning Sally Mae about the monkey seemed less important in the overall scheme of things than hiding from her. After all, she had been known to throw dogs out of her house for no apparent reason. A turn to the right would lead to a confrontation with her in the living room. A turn to the left would lead us into the bathroom, where no one would think of looking for us. So naturally, I chose to go left instead of right. Come on, Drover, into the bathroom. Only later did I discover that Drover didn't follow me into the bathroom. Only later did I realize why. The bathroom, bathroom door was open just a crack, and I went plunging inside, throwing the door back against the bathtub with such force that it made a loud whack. And this was followed shortly by a woman's scream. Ah! Well, you know what happened. Huh? By George, there she was in the bathtub, taking a bath with baby Molly. Instead of playing with her on the living room floor, where she should have been, at that hour of the day, well, her scream tipped me off that I had invaded a lady's privacy and given her a scare in the midst of her bath, and that perhaps I wasn't welcome in there. Of course, by the time I realized the error of my ways, I had motored out into the middle of the tile floor, hard tile, very slick, it made changing directions some, something of a problem. It was at this point that Sally Mayo nailed me on the nose with a wet wash cloth, cloth and exclaimed, Get out of my bathroom, you filthy dog! Well, let me pause here to point out that while I was in her bathroom and I was a dog, as she had noted, I was not filthy. That very morning, only hours before, I had cleaned myself in the overflow of the septic tank and we're talking about a complete immersion up to the tips of my ears. I might have carried a few random particles of dust on my body, but we must remember that dust comes from God's good earth. If dust comes from dirt and dirt comes from the ground, well, then it follows that her charge was groundless. Well, Sally Mae was a strong-armed ranch woman with a history of throwing rocks with deadly accuracy. 
and even sitting down in the bathtub clutching a towel to her chin and holding the baby in her lap, she could still deliver a stinging blow with a wet washcloth. That thing hurt, and it also blinded me since it draped across my nose and covered up my eyes. It hit right full rudder, reversed all... No, I'm sorry. Not it, but I. I hit right full rudder, reversed all the engines, spun around in a circle, fell down three times on the tile, and then got the old bod lined up with the door. I throttled down hard and took aim at the open door with every intention of getting the heck out of there. I'll never understand why little Alfred closed the door on me. Surely the kid, I mean, we were friends, right? Good pals, tight buddies. We'd played together and hiked together and laughed together. And I can't believe that he would have locked me in there with his mother, knowing full well that, on the other hand, the boy did have his ornery side. I noticed that a certain sparkle came to his eyes, like a match lit in total darkness, and that a nasty little smile leaped across his mouth. Hmm, yes. But the long and short of it was that I, blindfolded by a wet washcloth, went scrambling for what I suppose was an open door, only to find it closed. Did it hurt when I rammed the door? Why, yes, it did, but not nearly as badly as the bar of soap that Sally Mae sent whistling across the room. Like most of her shots, this one went straight home, got me right in the ribs. Clutching the towel to her chin, her hair in disarray and her eyes revealing destructive thoughts, she rose from the water like a sea monster. Get out of my bathroom! Hack! Get! Shoo! Scat! Hey, she wanted me out of her bathroom. Not nearly as badly as I wanted to get out, but it just so happened that she had raised a hoodlum child who got his laugh by locking innocent dogs up in bathrooms with insane naked women. Well, Sally Mae threw on her house coat and began flogging me with the towel. Near panic, I went sliding around the bathroom looking for an exit or a hole to climb into. Somehow, the trash can got knocked over and the toilet seat fell down with a crash and to towels and washcloths fell from their proper places. Suddenly, the little door, the door opened and little Alfred's face appeared. Hi, Mom, what are you doing? The grin on his face told it all. The little skunk had engineered this disaster and had been watching the entire show through the keyhole. But the weed of crime bears bitter fruit. The boy had not only pranked me, but he had pranked one of the toughest, smartest, and meanest Ranch wives in Ochiltree County. Did you let that dog in the house and then lock him in my bathroom? See, she's starting to see the true light of what happened here. She didn't wait for an answer, but snatched him up and turned him over her knee and frailed his little bottom. I paused for a moment to enjoy the first squalls from the little, little hoodlum, and then I seized this opportunity to run for my life. Well, we'll wait for chapter 10 tomorrow. Right now, I want y'all to tell your mom and daddy good night and have a good day tomorrow and tell them hello from Grandpa Phil. Okay? I'll see y'all tomorrow.